killed the firebird, bought a truck. He's still around, but I never see him. It's autumn now, and I feel those leaves turning colors and falling in me. My beard graying, hair gone, gravel in my throat, like seegers, like lakeside dirt roads. But in September or October, the occasional lightning storm visits once or twice before the snow flies with rain and with want. The sound of thunder shakes something loose in my mind. After the storm passes, the smell of ozone, the smell of a lake, I realize I've, I've arrived at Seeger's summertime. And for all of it, I start humming a song from 1976. Lord, I remember. Lord, I remember. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you much, up. Kevin. Yeah, especially love that last poem, Kevin. Thank you. And I hope, um, I'm still new to this, um, I had record on and then I noticed it was off, so then I put it back on again. So I know I got one poem, so mm -hmm. new technology here. <laughs> um, but in essence of time, okay. I'm, I'd like to have uh, Rich Boucher read next, another one of our um, awesome Poetry Playhouse Publications authors. And Rich is, uh, coming in from Albuquerque. And his uh, book is All of This Candy Belongs to Me. Yes. <laughs> so Rich, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody, welcome. Um, awful glad to have you here today. Uh, Kevin, gotta say, I love that song that the poem references. And I was thinking about that, uh, sitting up and wondering how far off that thunder is. Um, okay. So one poem from the Cotton Candy Forever section of my book, and then just a couple of short ones uh, from the Cinnamon Imperial section. This is called The Private Dances of Tegel Clut, New Hampshire. Everyone in Tegel Clut went to school together all at once as children and as high school children. Ringed by sturdy recalcitrant pines, this town remains balanced between autumn and winter. Plus there is a hardware store and pavilion in the middle. When a freckled baseball cap child catches a cold here, the entire town reaches for a handkerchief all at once in slow black and white synchronized motion. You have to be very careful if you are living here. This small town has that disease where fire grows naturally. You must exercise caution, and you must never be the reason for a shameful secret to exist, because secrets live almost as long as mosquitoes here. A lot of nights here have almost dozens of stars in them. Some nights here have only that one star by the half moon. Walk in the front door of Aphrodite's on the edge of town under a night with no moon to take you to your favorite seat. How many singles, like ladder rung slipping, do you have? You fold your bills vertically and prop them up near your beer. Vanessa is coming your way now, and her bikini is so pink, you can't even see her top under the thrumming neon. It costs so, so much to be danced upon in this town. So that was mm -hmm. The Private Dances of Tegel Clut, New Hampshire. And I have here now a couple of the short poems. And these come from, specifically, they come from um, the Cinnamon Imperial section of the book. It's for my mom. Music brings us together. Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto Number no. 4, and suddenly the pianist stops playing. Fingers come to a halt, the notes fading quick like some small scream in a forest cut off abruptly. His bow tie snaps. He cries out loud for his mother, yelling it really, as though his room was on fire. Mother, please, I need you. Mother, please. And there's a rumble in the amphitheater. Dresses and tuxedos rise from velvet cushions. There's a rising hush 
a rumbling muttering, and people cannot believe they paid for this. And after a full minute of his screaming, the house lights slowly come up, warming one by one. Yellow stars taking their places for act one, scene one of the evening sky. And I want to feel bad for him, this pianist, from all the way up here in this empty balcony. I really do. But he also happens to be my brother. And actually, I miss my mother too. And so uh, I've got another poem here to share. And it's, uh, it's fun dog-earing the pages of your own book. I actually like doing that. And so this poem is also from the Cinnamon Imperial section of the book. Uh, it's called Come At Me, Bro. The devil gets locked out of hell and panics struggling with the overwrought iron gates like an idiot, but they won't budge, locked, a firmly hard stone. And it occurs to the prince of darkness that he's going to have to find a new realm to rule. And so up he floats, up through the millions and millions of miles of dark, lightless, sulfurous underground earth, rising, rising, rising and holding his breath, pinching his nose with forefinger and thumb so that he doesn't get the bends as he rises toward the light. And just as his head pokes out of the ground, I lift my sandaled foot up and then down onto his horny head, and I stomp him back down under the ground, underneath the dew-dropped morning dawn, big grassy lawn of the world. I'm Jesus Christ, bitch. Nobody gets past me. One last one, also short. Riviera Dawn. Fuck home, muttered Dorothy. I'm not clicking my heels just to go back to that podunk wasteland. There's no place like Paris, Dorothy said. There's no place like Paris, said Dorothy again. There's no place like Paris, said Dorothy over and over again, until everyone around her got blurry, and she could hear harp strings blooming, and then Dorothy was in Paris. And then Dorothy was sipping some wine at a table along the Rue de l'Ecole de l'Esprance de l'Esprit de l'Autre, and then Dorothy wore a peacock mask and a tight black lacy bustier at a pleasure carnival in French woods, and then Dorothy heard calliope music and couldn't stop the Ferris wheels and her eyes from spinning, even when she closed her eyes, and then Dorothy never woke up again, and then a white wooden rocking chair on a windy, overcast Riviera dawn, rocking by itself, on and on. Thank you, Rich Boucher. Yay, Rich. <laughs> Reading from uh, All of This Candy Belongs to Me uh, by Poetry Playhouse Publications. Rich, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. And um, again, sometimes I want an illicit pleasure. <laughs> yes, that's right. And again, I want to thank Organic Books. Um, we were originally going to be reading at Organic Books, but now obviously we're reading in the Ethernet or the Internet or whatever you call this space. So um, you can order books through Organic Books if you want to support the local bookstores. I'm putting their, uh, they go through bookshop.org slash shop slash organic books, or you can just call them at 505-553-3823, Steve Brewer. So um, we were going to have uh, Eleanor Stewart read now. Eleanor, Eleanor. I think we lost her, so I'm hoping Eleanor. she's going to come back. So Megan, are you? Do you want to read next, Megan Baldridge? Yes, I. I, I, okay. I think Eleanor is there. I can see her there. You can see Eleanor. 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 Oh, here we go. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Eleanor. So we All see. right. We're well good. We're good. Okay. Eleanor's uh, book is um, called She Tells Us Stories. And uh, she's uh, calling in from Albuquerque. Welcome, Eleanor. Uh, 
Eleanor? Here. I'm trying to unmute you. Eleanor, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Here, I'm going to unmute everybody. Just there, to... I'm unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the subtitle of the book is Experiences and Epiphanies. I've decided to read only three, Jules, so that I can show you Sounds good. a scarf, a beautiful, beautiful scarf that is connected to one of them. Uh, am I on? Yes, you're on. <clears throat> okay. I don't see her. They don't see me. They see Deb. Yes. Yeah. She, you're fine, Eleanor. Okay. I see you. The first poem in the book is called The College Girl. Uh, it's a memoir, but it's a very expanded kind of memoir. But this is the first poem. She walked around the, the small town of Marietta as though she were an explorer. Her uniform was black tights and ballet slippers, a brown velveteen tunic like Robin Hood's, or else a brown wool sweater with two wear holes in it. Now, this wasn't the village in NYC. This was Ohio, home of blending in. She wore her innocent armor to say, I am in the theater in my own imagined world. She was 18 and had long brown hair. She walked alone, but I don't remember lonely. Later, there was lots of lonely, but then she was proudly self-sufficient. And here's the thing, she was safe, not a thought of danger, except from the mighty river that flowed nearby. She had been taught to fear its power, but only river rats hung out down there. And she was a theater person who wanted to be seen as a tragic heroine. But everyone said, she looked happy all the time. Hello and goodbye, young Eleanor. No way you could recognize me now. You didn't dream how far I'd go from that little college town, how far from the theater, and yet how deep into the drama of the world. I look plenty tragic now, romantic, foolish girl, and all it took was sorrow, pain, and lots and lots of time. Okay. <laughs> I'm skipping over to the section um, called Epiphanies. Incidentally, I want to show you a little mark on the page. Can you see that little mark? That was Jewel's idea because I needed to separate these poems and I didn't have headings or titles, so we used those. This one is called Kamakura. I found a magic city. I thought it was all mine. Old temples never bombed a side street and a shrine. An American had saved it from bombing in the war. Kyoto, Nara, Kamakura were too beautiful to burn. I'd never heard of him. Just Hiroshima's tomb. Warner is his name. His face is carved on stone. And it was for me he saved those ancient wooden doors, the golden Ichio tree, the Shinto fox shrine too. And I gave it all to you one winter afternoon. You'd never seen a city that never had been bombed. We met and walked its lanes. You are a modern man who couldn't pass the fox that guards the sacred tomb. It seemed to me the way we met, our love could never end. We transcended time and age. You were my loved one then. But now I need it back again, my ancient magic town, 
You stole my Kamakura and bombed the magic down. Hey. Here is a picture. Can you see it? I, I, it's so hard to. Can you see that at all? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. That is Warner, Dr. Langdon Warner, uh, who, and this is a memorial in the Kamakura train station to him because those Japanese people have never forgotten who it was that saved their city. And these are the, I guess these are the kinds of things that you don't learn, you know, from the media. You have to kind of be there because it was a long time ago. Well, um, the reason I picked that poem from the Japan uh, series is because I gave this book, I sent this book to a young Frenchman named Francois Chapineau, who used to perform at winnings. You all remember winnings? Mm -hmm. And he used to come there and I would go every week and I met a lot of fascinating people. So he was a student and he performed there. And when he went back to his country, he, he wrote something to me that is, is the title of my next and last uh, poem. And <clears throat> he wanted a copy of the book. So I sent it to him. And I want to show you what he sent me from France in return. Ta da! Look, can you see it? Can you see all the colors in it? Can you see this beautiful big scarf? Isn't that pretty, Jules? Mm hmm So here's the poem. I wrote it in 2017 and I wish it were out of date, but it's not. I weep for your country that I love so much. For Francois, June 2017. He's in his mid-twenties and a university student whose fingers fly on a metal guitar as he plays many styles of our music from flamenco to country. Everyone knows that France has tons of culture, but he prefers ours. So why is he weeping? Since Trump... Even foreign students have been afraid to go home. Since Trump, xenophobia is on the rise. Since Trump, America has turned away from the Paris Accords. Since Trump, intelligence has given way to idiocy. Since Trump, the lady France gave us is turning her face away from refugees, turning toward fascism, turning toward fear and racism and greed away from our national parks and the animals who live there, away from clean energy and the future, away from the world. I wrote back to Francois, I weep that you love my country so much. I will welcome your return. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Eleanor. That was Eleanor Stewart, and she was reading from her book, She Tells Us Stories, Experiences, and Epiphanies. And um, it's, uh, it's just really great that we can have these readings. And, and one way um, we can include people that would not be able to make it to organic books in Albuquerque. So. Um, I see we have people here besides New Mexico. We have uh, New York and Minnesota. New York. Um, and I think Megan, you're, uh, I see Fonda here, or she's calling Denver. in. So Denver, okay. So it, it kind of opens it up in a way. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, so Megan Baldridge is our next reader, and it's been really fun publishing her books. We started out with her first book, which was Unprecedented, yes, and that, a lot of those poems are still ring true today. And Sadly. <laughs> Megan has a great sense of humor. She also, we also published uh, Cedro about 
her dog poems, and then she's on to knitting poems. Uh, I lose track. She's got, let's see, she's got, the first one was, uh, I think, Knitting Matters, and that was a, a New Mexico Arizona Book Award, and, and Eleanor also had a book award, and Kevin, so we, we've got, um, we're really proud of having some of these. And Jules. <laughs> yeah, me and John, and so, but, and uh, back to Megan, she's got, let's see, Knitting Circumstances, Under the Knitfluence, Knitting Matters, Knititude, and I think you've got a new knitting one too, <laughs> right? A couple. <laughs> I'm forgetting. <laughs> I'm, it's too many, too many knitting books. <laughs> but also thanks to Denise Weaver Ross, who uh, has has helped many many of us design our books. Who's a poet in her own right, and just fantastic that she has a little time now for poetry, but also has has done a wonderful job helping many of us out with designing. Um, who's here also, so I hope she's mm -hmm. going to be reading. So yeah. um, thanks, Jules. Is that <laughs> that? I think that's that's enough knitting titles, right? <laughs> um, I am. Uh, there's always room for another knitting title. Right? Maybe a crochet <laughs> book next. <laughs> yeah. No, we knitters look down on crochet. Sorry. There's a, there's a hierarchy. Um, but uh, I am going to be reading about my dog. One poem oh, about cool. dog. One poem, one political poem, and one knitting poem that's not too okay. knitterish. Um, so the, the dog poem, The Bicycling Canine. On cold, sleeting days, if my dog and I skip our walk, he fits in an in indoor walk. Right there in the kitchen, he is off and running, all the while napping. His legs fastened shut, his eyes fastened shut, he bicycles four legs, in full pursuit of a wily raccoon. Raccoon caught, he deliriously drifts into a vinyasa routine. Then minutes later, pumps his twitching legs back up into a high-speed chase of more randy raccoons or preening porcupines, or is it terrorizing tomcats? A multitasking sleeper, he saves the neighborhood, exercises the bad guys, and tones his calves if left alone to nap. Meanwhile, I am backpedaling about whether I have time for the gym today. I wish, like him, I could exercise in a snoring position. Uh, and then- I love it, I love it. <laughs> thank you. Um, this is from a book uh, called Unprecedented and I thought he'd be out by now, but anyway, this is called Dear Republican Congressmen and Women, Please Protect My Medical Insurance. Uh, before Obama, I had switched jobs. I was a teacher and I s switched jobs uh, a few summers. I would go to a different school. And every time I went to a different school, I would stick with Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, and, but, uh, in the meantime, I had, um, some precancerous cells in my vagina and following my doctor's recommendation, he, he, uh, uh su suggested that I had, had some surgery. And so when I, one of those times when I switched jobs, Blue Cross Blue Shield, which I will now call BCBS or simply BS, then told me that I had a pre existing condition since I'd gotten surgery to take care of uh, whatever might have ailed me. And they could only insure me if we dropped the vaginal insurance. So that's the prelude to the poem. We will never know who inside BS decided to stop insuring my vagina. Previous to firing, to the firing of my vagina, I had never before uttered the words vagina out loud. Now multiple times every day, I was saying vagina, vagina, vagina on the phone to strangers in Napier, Illinois, arguing for my vagina's inclusion and its future good health to no avail. Blue Cross Blue Shield assured me that BS didn't want to uninsure my vagina, they were only following standard procedures. Yes, I could talk to the boss. The boss said, if you read your policy handbook, you will 
see that we can no longer cover your vagina. And yes, they would charge the same premium for my body, even without its essential part. But there was good news. If I wanted, they would re-examine the case of my vagina in five years. And of course I was free to switch insurance companies. In the meantime, I became a woman with a marked vagina and a pre-existing condition. I warned my private part, girlfriend, pull it together, get healthy or else. Two years later, after a small left knee surgery and a new job, you can guess, BS wrote me that regrettably under my next new policy, my left leg was to be amputated from coverage. Once again, deep in the bowels of the BS world, someone was making money betting against some of me. I felt the stress in my weakest links building up. The day before, my leg felt healed. Now it was injured. A map of me during the late Bush years showed a vulnerable vagina, a stressed out left leg, a balkanized body. Rancorously, my body parts and I no longer trusted one another. My right knee looked down on my left knee. Every part looked down on my you know what. And I looked over at BS, my insurance company, with deep suspicious suspicion and horror. My small contribution to make America great again, resist divisive pre-existence. Okay. And so that, thank you. That is that. And um, I am, uh, this is from Knitting Matters. Um, it's called a slow soliloquy. I am making a slow sweater. The process of knitting each tiny stitch on the eight stitches per inch pullover is a de deliciously, divinely drawn out dawdle. At maximum speed, I knit an inch of sweater front every two hours. After a hundred hours with luck, the sweater will be finished someday. I enjoy making a beautiful garment at a sloth's pace. As I knit, I drink from a reservoir of time Luxuriate in my garden, surrounding me, darting bees, sunning lizards and all. While slow knitting, I have time to consider the book I'm reading, write a new poem in my head, compare the colors of lemon and rose hollyhocks, and keep track of my neighbor's comings and then their goings. Nowadays, old-fashioned, wannabe slower knitting people can always slow the sweater to a crawl, they can raise their own sheep, card spin, dye their own wool. The slow poke in me knows my knitting is just the right speed of slow, not as slow as raising a baby lamb, not as fast as ordering a sweater from Amazon Prime. Thank you. Thank you, Megan Baldridge. Yay. <laughs> Thank so, you, uh, Megan. We always ask Megan, um, to, do so you have your yarn stocked up now? <laughs> you get a good stash, everyone will be happy. I can, I can make it through about three years. I'm kind of <laughs> for a long, a long sequestering because I've got a lot. I got a big stash, and no one's bothering me. All at right. all. Um, yeah, so pile of sweaters when we're done here. Are yeah. you taking orders? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm not taking orders at present, Eleanor, but. There's oh, a shoot. pure poison <laughs> And you have a really very nice scarf there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You could always, you know, trade knitted goods for toilet paper. Well, I <laughs> try to work out. Well, I also have a, I'm one of those people who always had toilet paper. So I did. <laughs> uh, always had a big stash. But I might trade Billy Brown. Uh, for cookies. <laughs> you know, yeah. He just left, he just looks like he left the room. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, thank you all. Well, thanks, Megan. Okay, up Megan. next, we have John Roach up next, and he's in the Poetry Playhouse, Casita. Yeah, here's our and, uh, <laughs> playhouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John is my husband and partner, and um, he's, I don't know what you're going to be reading. I get, and he's um, done all of the Poets Speak series, so the Trump. Uh, hers, Water, Walls, and Survival. 
and also Mojo. Mm -hmm. So, John, tell us what you're reading. And uh, also, uh, the next, I'm working on the next uh, Poetry Playhouse book that will be uh, Rochester poet Colleen Powderly's book, um, which is coming out, we hope, uh, uh, we hope in June, uh, May or June. So that's, that's coming up soon as well. Um, I wanted just to start with another little adver advertisement for um, organic books. Uh, Steve Brewer, and again, you can just go to bookshop.org uh, slash shop slash organic books and check it out. And, and Steve says, buy any new book in the world shipped directly to your doorstep. We have posted shelves of suggestions that we continue to build daily, but you can search for any new book as well. Um, proceeds go to our store if that's where you're, if that's where you start. And a portion is set aside for all participating indies to share. And um, they also, you can also order gift certificates from organic books. Okay, so um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I thought I would start with one of the Poets Speak uh, volumes and this one, you know, survival seemed appropriate to look at. It was the last uh, and the thickest of the Poets Speak anthologies. Raise your hand if you have something in the Poets Speak series. Okay, quite a few of you. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so, um, uh, I thought I'd read one from uh, from a friend in Rochester, Patricia Roth Schwartz. It's called Carol Breaking Bread. I delect this gift of bread, a long, flat, salt-encrusted rustic loaf from the bakery where my friend works her second job. She can use the money, but really, I think she loves it for the way the air in that close, warm room becomes fragrant how butter creams its way into flour, the pouring in of honey, vanilla bean, cardamom, caraway, the work of her hands, a poem, the poem, a sacrament. And um, follow up with one here from Mary McGinnis, Santa Fe poet, uh, Patricia uh, Roth Schwartz is uh, in um, Waterloo, New York, central New York. Mary, now this is Mary McGinnis, from Santa Fe, and it's called Stay Time. Stay, this time for eating corn chips together, telling our common pain, this afternoon firm and reassuring as tofu. Young we are not, but the house of staying alive is strong. I have room for my sister poets, utmost in my memory. We had a little rain and snow this month. We can still buy fresh eggs and organic cotton socks. So there are quite a few poets from all over the country and some other countries. And then uh, I thought I'd read a poem from Feeling the Distance. And this was a book that we put out this January uh, for our good friend, Stuart S. Warren, a poet and publisher who sadly died of ca cancer last fall. We had a wonderful gathering with I don't know, 80 or so people at Tortuga Gallery in January. This is called Feeling, the, uh, the book is called Feeling the Distance. And again, available through organic books. Um, <clears throat> and I thought I would just read a short poem from Stuart, um, partly because we have bobcats in our backyard occasionally. This is called Sighting Close to Town. You coax links from her lair into daylight dreaming. You remember a song or scent or a then when she walked among us. Rightly, she scoffed at documentation. But watch out, any tangle on this desert could cost her blood. And though they shake rattles in her face and pet her with rope, their version of love, she can never lose the sleekness that runs through the black of her. At dusk, her iridescence begins to show. The tracks she leaves leave only stardust. Two pairs 
of golden eyes float in silence. Stuart S. Warren. We also just published a book uh, of poems by many of the people here, many of his friends uh, in his honor, offerings from the journey. And uh, Billy Brown here was going to feature our book launch, but uh, that's been postponed, sadly. Okay, I think I've got one more uh, poem, and that's from one of mine from today. And uh, it's called Palm Sunday in Placidus. And it starts with a, an epigram from uh, Robert Hunter of the Grateful Dead. It looks like Palm Sunday again. Something, I'm seeing iPhone here. Can you still see me? Jules? You're back, John. I'm back. We can, we can see you. Uh, okay, all right, I just lost my picture for a second. Yep. Uh, okay, you can hear me okay. Yep. Um, a passable day for the least of men, sang Jerry. Many passing since, many passion plays. Many tulips come and gone, my oh my. Now it's Lent without ending, Easter indefinitely postponed. Will the choir please stand six feet apart for the duration of Handel's Messiah? The pastor's already six feet under. Handle your snakes wisely. Give me a drop of venom to ease the pain. Tequila or mezcal maybe kill the virus. Wave those palms, wave them high. It's 72 and sunny, laugh or cry. Bet on the quail as they round the bend, bobcat on the prowl and a hawk overhead. Juniper dropping pollen as the lilacs buzz. You sneeze and you cough and you cover your mouth. Stigmata from a choya thorn, frozen pierogies but no butter lamb. Gather the family round the Zoom tomb. Ride on your donkey all the way to Calvary. It looks like Palm Sunday again. Okay. Thanks, John. That's a good one. You wrote it just this morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicely done, John. With my, with Thank my you. prompt. Yeah. Yeah, Joel's prompt was palm, so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so next up we have Aaron Marsh. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Aaron. And Aaron, Aaron is joining us from up north in Bemidji, Minnesota. So welcome. And Aaron uh, visited here, I think it was last September. September. And, um, and I'd like to announce, you know, Kevin and Aaron have been here, so it's really nice to have, it. but not everybody has met everybody, so it's really nice to have everybody here together. So um, Aaron's book we published is called Disability Isn't Sexy, and uh, Denise did the cover for that, and the cover art is by Albuquerque artist Ro Libretto. You can uh, put that up just a little, there you go, yeah. So welcome, Aaron. Hey. Thank you. I'm glad that everybody's here. Um, I'll start out with the um, title poem from the collection. So it's called Disability Isn't Sexy. Is it showing up at your boyfriend's office wearing nothing but brightly colored sneakers? The left one built up one and a half inches to improve your gait and a trench coat. Your flowered cane is propped against the wall because you need both hands to unbutton the coat. Reveal your naked body. Matching tangles of scars at the hips, raised blooms to set off pale, freckled skin. It is being unable to grab your lover's hand, walk side by side to your apartment door. Holding hands, the physical connection of his fingers covering yours turns violent. Limping tosses your body away from his. Now the purpose of his grasp is to keep you upright on equal footing. It is equipment. 
if it weren't for the blue four-wheeled walker complete with black plastic seat in case you tire sorry <laughs> in case you tire and your bouquet of multicolored canes you would have been able to fit a king-size bed when he enters the bedroom the red scarf you've draped over the lamp doesn't fool him he tells you it still looks like a hospital room when you display your naked body across the quilt he tells you it still feels like he's bedding someone's grandmother. Um, my next poem, oh, thank you, um, is called, uh, the rest of this poem is the title leads into the poem, so I'll just read the title. You could easily pick me out of a police lineup, but you won't, will you? To identify me as the woman who digs through the trash set out in the alley would mean I am the same woman brought home from the bar last night. It means at some point you overlooked my left leg, dented and scarred. The lopsided hips onto which was stitched a map of the rivers and tributaries of another planet. The fat gathered at my stomach, awaiting further instructions. No one saw me limping from the car to your front door my bulky body lurching left with each step. You wouldn't have needed to explain my presence to anyone, but I fled your bed at dawn. What we had did not save me. I awoke the neighbors as they foraged for love in your garbage can, frantically digging, tipping it over, like a raccoon scurrying away as back porch lights switch on, making do with whatever bits I managed to snatch. That's great, Erin. Thank you. Hey, I know about the cat. I'm surprised ours isn't here. They always <laughs> come up. <laughs> um, the, last, the last poem I'll read from the collection is called um, Be Nice to Yourself When You're Alone. And this is um, based on, I haven't listened to a podcast with Sharon Olds, and this was her advice. So I just went from there. Be nice to yourself when you're alone. It is suggested you begin by kissing your own wrist. You will taste your perfume the way a lover does when kissing behind an ear. Run your tongue across your lips over and over. Memorize the briny flavor of skin mixed with patchouli. Let your taste buds conjure an Arctic ocean where you are the only shipwreck lining the seabed, covered lovingly in protective sand and silt for the rest of your days. And then I thought I would read um, one new poem. Um, and I'm reading this one because I think my nephew is listening. So um, <laughs> he's in it. So I thought I had better read it for him. <laughs> my nephew tells me a dying squid turns white as it loses control of the muscles that expand and contract the chromatophores containing pigment near the surface of their skin. I want to be horrified at a video of a man killing a row of them, one by one, using a red-handled knife. But I watch and watch again. That night, I dream of syringes full of magenta ink and a little girl playing at God aboard her father's ship. She inserts a silver needle into the squid's soft mantle, shrieks as the pink she thought would bring life spurts, spurts onto the plank deck. As a young woman, I paid a man to ink that same shade onto my left forearm. Now a beloved man rubs a firm thumb over the pink explosion, convinced it has always been a part of me. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. It's a pleasure. To Thank you, Erin. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm up next here. So, um, and we're going a little bit over, but, you know, feel free to hang on as long as you want. Um, I'll read one, uh, a quick Sestina from Homesick Ben, and this was one of the winners in multiple awards for poetry from the New Mexico, Arizona Book Award. So I have to read a Sestina. The one thing about going over when you're at home is the chairs are more comfortable than they are in the bookstore. <laughs> They're not kicking us out of the bookstore, so. <laughs> okay, so this is called A Kind of Courage, and it's a Sestina. 
and the prompt, um, I use this prompt in my Sistina classes, like what kind of blank is it? So it starts out with a question. What kind of courage is it? The anxious, scary kind, the pottery on her aunt's shelf in turquoise blue, chipped on the rim, well-worn and loved. Through three generations and now you are responsible for keeping it safe, handling it to save your life. What kind of fool takes their life and leaps into their unfamiliar? It's a congested kind of dust responsible for new allergies, a woman who never knew the kinds of de desert plants that would settle into her love of chamesa, blooming yucca, juniper, an incredible blue sky, blue hovering sadness, blue disappearing into the great lakes, her life out of the fog of waiting, how she loved seeing dad at the kitchen table, 6 a.m. It was him alone eating breakfast cereal, kindness in his hands as she joined him, responsible for getting up for school, responsible with mom and brother still in bed. Her blue eyes join his dream world of working trucks, kinds of home calling her away even then. Life someday giving her offices, cubicles, typewriters, it never stopped with just carbon paper and blue stencils loved by her mom's church secretary upper office, love of the smell of mimeograph bulletins, responsible for news and prayer chains in the next holy season. It churns them out around the wheel of yellow, blue, purple, pink, and red. She waits for her life to arrive at the front steps, waits for the boy on the motorcycle, kind of coming to pick her up, where they kind of talk and lay down in the green park grass, where love eludes her young body this time. Life will grow on in years, waiting to be responsible for her own wedding crystal, her own blue sky over her grandmother's lost grave in Iowa. It takes her prairie life and leads her a kind of courage it gives her love of the wind her response to chipped blue pottery but a homesick okay and i'll do one out of the zobra poems which is uh the zobra the burning man of santa fe which is another uh, new mexico arizona book award winner yes this one for for um it wasn't um, poetry. I got a mind blank. It was uh, anyway. philosophy. What? Philosophy. It was philosophy. Philosophy. Yes, Reli religion and philosophy, which is what poets are, right? So um, I'm gonna read. I haven't read this one in a while. It's called Zobra on Life Insurance. I thought, you know, so I. It was really interesting. I got a letter in the mail from I think it was my work life insurance or some default thing that oh if you're not covered for COVID-19. Oh, gee, thanks a lot. So that's this one. Zazobra's life insurance actuary calculates death on a spreadsheet, but a bus could hit him tomorrow. It just did to a friend of a friend. His neighbor dropped dead in the kitchen, but the stars are still burning hydrogen. Zozobra dies every year in the burn, a pre-existing condition making his heirs ineligible for a payoff. His Prometita says she'll survive. He brings joy to thousands of spectators every September when fireworks explode over the city, a chemical reaction that never changes from year to year. His paper stuffing will outlast any mortality table. These poems seem to have a, a new meaning to them when we're um, in this age of the pandemic. Um, I'm going to read one last poem. This is a newer one that's not published and it's called Highways. I wrote it in one of our Playhouse workshops, well, maybe three, four months, a couple, three months ago, maybe. I could die here. On I-35, I have heated seats in my Malibu. Midwest metro area exit below zero. My breath frosts the inside of my windshield as defroster chugs, jumper cables, and trunk. 
Dad says, don't go below a quarter tank of gas, survival kit, candy bars, black ice, whiteouts. Cold has no smell, only a sting as it runs up my nose. On I-40, the monsoon hits in summer. Cars stop under bridges or weave in and out if the police find an abandoned car. It would probably be 24 hours before they find you, dead or alive, or you'll get hit on the freeway or sucked into a dust devil. That invisible safety glass from my windshield I take for granted. If broken, the cold gets me, the heat gets me, the water gets me, or I go along without a thought of the dangerous speeds I am traveling when everything is right, radio rocking, my destination known. So thanks. Hey. So <laughs> Good, job. Good job. Nicely done, Jules. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, and we're going to wrap this up with Denise Weaver Ross. Yay. So, Denise wraps everything up for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's a graphic designer, poet, artist, great friend, and uh, we're happy to have you here, Denise. In design expert, troubleshooter. Uh, we're coming out in June, mm -hmm. maybe with an art show, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a we, we wanted we wanted to do a, a class together, so we'll have to see. Yeah, so we'll just have to see where we all are with the virus by June. Mm -hmm. But uh, the book will come out regardless. So this is the I put out a book of poetry with each suit of my House of Cards um, series, and this is the combination of the whole of the whole series in one book. So you get all the you get all the art plus all the poems. Mm -hmm. so it's, but today I've been writing a lot, I guess because you know you cancel all these gallery events and suddenly I have time to write poetry. So I've been writing a lot of poetry and I want to read two short ones and um, one long one from the sort of COVID collection. Um, and you can kind of see sort of one is the beginning of the month, one's the middle of the month and one was today. And you can kind of see my own uh, progression through denial to acceptance <laughs> of the situation. So the first one's called, Upon the Coming of the Zombie Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> the contagion is among us, so now comes the time of fear. Fear of shortages and hoarding as we stockpile to protect our own. Fear of the stranger, the visitor, and the recently traveled. Fear of sickness, of death. We worship youth, beauty, and wealth and are ready to beggar ourselves to pretend that we won't die, if not from this reaper, then from one of its brethren, becoming what we fear, the walking dead. Mm -hmm. So that was my so first COVID poem. And then the second one I wrote, started to write the day our gallery closed in Old Town, that where I show regularly, a ghost wolf gallery. So this is called Escape from New York. Mm -hmm. On the last day our gallery was open, I met a couple that owns a gallery in Tribeca with 12,000 square feet. New York City closed them down due to COVID-19. So they hopped into their car and began driving west eight hours a day. The plan is to stop and sightsee until they reach Ventura Beach. I'm wondering when they reach the Pacific Ocean, will they buy a boat and keep moving on until the crisis is over? Can you outrun a virus? Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, today, and the long one is from today, and again from Jules' uh, prompt, Palm. <laughs> so this is called Degrees of Separation. Two degrees of separation is how close the virus has now come to our family. The news arrived today while holding a video chat in the palm of my hand with family and friends from Georgia, Massachusetts, and New York City, each appearing in a tiny box on my iPhone. Carl in Brooklyn broke the news. His brother is on the ventilator in Queens. Remember when we followed Carl racing from Massachusetts to Connecticut into New York while he was playing tricks to see if I could keep up with him in our old Buick with the sticky clutch? I was so relieved when we finally drove over the Whitestone Bridge into Queens where we stayed with Carl's brother and his girlfriend. It was 1984. 
Your brother Wayne got married the next day in Brooklyn, followed by a reception in Flatbush, a New York slice of the Caribbean, and you stopped and picked up a stick of sugar came from the market. I was the whitest thing on the street that day. While we waited for Auntie Barbara, who had flown in from Jamaica, a couple of brothers stopped their cars in the middle of the street and were staring at me just as Auntie arrived. She stared back at them and sucked her teeth, saying, Cha, you think they've never seen a white girl before? And so we turned around and went inside, stuffing ourselves with curry goat, rice and peas, plantain, and a slice of the largest wedding cake I had ever seen, made from Jamaican fruitcake. The fruit soaked in rum and port six months in advance. We danced all night and laughed in the corner with your friend Michael. A couple of years later, he was the best man at our wedding, and we saw him for the last time as he lay emaciated and dying in a Coney Island hospital from a rare form of brain cancer that had no name and turned out to be the result of AIDS. So on Palm Sunday, I stop and pray for the health of Carl's brother and for us all. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Well, that wraps our reading and I'm going to unmute everybody in a second here. I know we've had some last. You want to introduce bags? This is my kitty bags. So mm -hmm. saying hi to Aaron's cat and any other pets out there. Jojo. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I think we had some last minute people join us. So welcome. Um, yeah, support organic books, um, support books in general. I hope everybody's reading and writing. Um, if you go to the Jules Poetry Playhouse Facebook page, um, we've got a private prompt group going. So just let me know if you want to join that. Um, otherwise, we post all our events on there. And I really hope everybody has um, a good rest of the day. And a couple of things again coming up, Jules. Uh, We've got a okay. class with Donald Levering. We're um, Santa Fe poet Donald Levering pumping up the pantoum, uh, which is going to be uh, Saturday, April 18th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Time. We're going to be doing it by Zoom. Um, Donald's an awesome poet. Um, he is amazing. And he's taught before for us, and he's, he's, he's an amazing teacher as well. And then there's the Cactus Open Mic. Cactus reading and open mic, also featuring Donald Levering, and that will be the last Tuesday of April, whatever day that is, the twenty eighth, maybe. Also, um, if I could chime in, seven seven p.m. our time. What? Would it be yeah. okay to chime yeah. in? Yeah, Rich. What about Rich? Real quick. Hey, Rich. I have a new yeah, pantoum we've seen up in the yes. COVID group on Facebook, and right. also sure. going to be double featuring with Donald Levering in the fall. Wonderful. Good, good. Okay. This is right. really, I, I have, I have two I'm things to say. Everybody just to... Okay. Billy's talking. Yeah, uh, Rich Boucher and Donna Levering are, are double featuring in the fall at Fiction Free, by which time we will be on Zoom or maybe off of Zoom by then. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do, I do want to mention that on Thursday, the 23rd of April, Fiction Free will be on Zoom with uh, featuring Eline Gush and Rennie Golden. Oh, good, good. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. And thanks, Billy. That you're. I'm glad you're going to do Zoom for Fiction. Yeah. That should be awesome. I've been teaching. I've been teaching my statistics class on Zoom, so yeah. I got it down. Good. Thanks, everybody. It was wonderful. Thanks for all the poets. Yeah, thank I you, just, Jules. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to say hi to everybody. Hey, it's nice to you. Great to see you. Mama. Thanks for Hello, Mama. Hey, Kitty. Uh, <laughs> Bay. Where's Kitty? I had Bay. another conference. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, good to see you. Yeah. Hey, from Rochester. Gretchen is here from Rochester.